Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Jerry Bone. I'm a cattle feeder, a farmer and a cattle producer from South Central Kansas. I also am privileged to serve as president-elect of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I'm pleased to welcome you to the webinar focused on beef cattle nutrition, specifically protein supplementation. We're proud to be working with several leading experts on cattle nutrition bring you these, free, these webinars on this topic during October. As a participant, your line will be muted, but feel free to type in questions in the question box on your screen during the webinar, and at the end of the presentations, we will get to as many of those as time will allow. If you have trouble with your technology, or if you're joining us only for the audio, the webinar is being recorded it will be available for viewing in a few days at ncba.org. Just look for the producer tab on the website. Now I would like to thank our sponsor for this webinar, the National Corn Growers Association. It's been great to work for on producer education initiatives with, in, with the National Corn Growers Association these past several years. The webinar tonight will feature Dr. Jason Smith with Texas A&M University and Dr. Jeff Lindcooler from the University of Kentucky. Both are ruminant nutritionists with ex expertise on protein supplementation. But tonight we'll represent strategies for different climates and geographies. Jason, the floor is yours to get us started on our seminar tonight and thank you all for your participation. All right, thank you, Jerry. I greatly appreciate the introduction and the, the opportunity to be here tonight. I think I can speak on behalf of Dr. Lim Cooler and myself and say it's absolutely a, a privilege to be able to visit with you all about this topic. Um, Dr. Lim Cooler and I discussed really how we wanted to go about um, trying to present to you some hopefully impactful, useful information that you can you can take home to your operation um, and and really focusing on nationwide strategies. And, and we, we recognize and realize that that there are some differences across the country in how we do things from the standpoint of supplementing and managing and feeding cattle. But the reality is that from a protein supplementation standpoint, about 95% of what we do and what we know applies regardless of which side of the Mississippi River we're on, uh, regardless of how much rainfall uh, that we receive. And, and we're also going to do things a little differently tonight uh, compared to maybe some of the other webinars uh, where you may may have different speakers presenting different areas and different aspects. What, what Dr. Limkuhler and I decided to do uh, is, is take, a, take a comprehensive approach. We we sat down and, and worked together on developing this slide set that we're going to navigate through over the next hour or so. And, and I'm going to take lead in, in working us through those slides. Uh, and, and Dr. Limkuhler is going to chime in and, and provide some additional uh, information as necessary uh, going throughout tonight's webinar. So I'm, I'm definitely privileged to have the opportunity to, to work with Jeff uh, on this. But we're really going to split this into, into three main areas that we'll work through. And the first of those that if we're going to talk about protein supplementation, we have to have some understanding of the fundamentals of protein nutrition for beef cattle. Okay. And really how we will address this tonight is we're going to have a focus on grass cattle. So focus on, on cow calf and, and stalker operations uh, for the most part, because there are some things that are a little different about how we would do things uh, if we're talking about uh, feeding cattle or finishing cattle in a feed yard. Then we're going to move into really an overview of, of protein supply and requirements. Again, going to talk about some of the differences between cows and, and growing cattle and won't focus uh, quite as much on, on the finishing sector. And then we're going to wrap up with some considerations for meeting requirements. So, so discuss and integrate methodology, but also a little bit of focus on, on economics. So, so as we get started and moving through this topic, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll begin with fundamentals of protein nutrition. And the reality is that beef cattle have fairly well-known requirements for metabolizable protein. Uh, so for, 
for a lot of people that may be a new phrase We're, we are used to hearing about protein uh, in the light of or, or hearing it referred to as crude protein but what metabolizable protein is is it's really the true protein that's absorbed in the intestine and that is ultimately going to serve as a source of amino acids to the animal the reality is that that all animals have requirements for amino acids but rumen fermentation substantially complicates our ability to to objectively quantify uh, what those are and so we're nowhere near the understanding of amino acid requirements for for beef cattle as we are for non-ruminant livestock animals such as pork or, or poultry okay and so metabolizable protein is going to be supplied to that animal uh, through really one of two different sources. The first of those being microbial crude protein and the second being rumen undegradable protein. I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the differences in those. But before we do that, I think it's important that we, we cover or at least briefly mention that feedstuffs have different protein fractions. So protein is not protein is not protein. Okay, unfortunately, it's, it's not as simple as all protein uh, being the same. And so if we think about that crude protein measurement that we look at on a, on a feed tag or an analysis results, that crude protein is really just a measurement of nitrogen. And we make some assumptions because on average, uh, the nitrogen content of protein is fairly consistent. So we basically analyze nitrogen, multiply that by 6.25 and get to a crude protein value. But that crude protein is made up of true actual protein and then non-protein nitrogen. And that's one of the unique things about, about ruminants and beef cattle that we'll talk about is that ruminants can take that non-protein nitrogen that really is not truly protein and, and turn it into protein that's actually useful. Okay, and then we can we can break protein uh, into the fractions that depend upon it, their site and extent of digestion. And so we we break those into rumen degradable versus undegradable fractions. Uh, and you may have previously heard those referred to as degradable intake protein or undegradable intake protein, uh, recent change in, in terminology. What this chart shows on the right, don't get lost in the numbers, but, but it, we just wanted to use this as an opportunity to show uh, first that there's a substantial amount of variation in protein content of, of various feedstuffs. These were just a few select uh, sources of, of protein or sources of supplemental energy uh, that we chose to express their protein content. But if we look at the last two columns in that table, these feedstuffs not only differ in their protein content, but they all also differ in the proportionality of what is degradable in the rumen versus what is not degradable in, in the rumen, okay? And so I mentioned that that metabolizable protein is is provided through microbial crude protein and rumen undegradable protein. Okay, and so this is another area that really complicates um, this this quantification of the amount of true protein that's actually being delivered to the animal, because what happens is when that animal consumes a feed it's consuming some portion of that feed as uh, rumen degradable protein, okay? What happens when it hits that, that rumen environment, which really is just a big fermentation fat, is rumen microorganisms, they're gonna take that degradable protein fraction, or at least a portion of it, uh, depending upon the diet, depending upon how fast it flows through the system, and they're gonna break that down into its amino acid building blocks. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna further reduce those, those amino acid building blocks to ammonia. The microbes are fairly selfish in that. They're then gonna take that ammonia and then they're gonna incorporate it into their own bodies in the form of the amino acids that they need. So they're gonna use that am ammonia to build their own amino acids. And then eventually those microorganisms are gonna flow out of the system. Uh, they're gonna hit the abomasum, so that fourth, um, compartment of the, the ruminant foregut. Uh, they're going to hit that acid environment and then move into the acid environment of the small intestine where their bodies are actually going to be digested and, and broken down. And so then that is going to serve as a source of, of protein uh, 
uh, and ultimately a source of amino acids uh, for the animal. Okay. Now, one of the things that, that we often uh, will see referenced on, on feed tags, particularly uh, when, when we start talking about our, our liquid type supplements, whether they're in tub or a true uh, still uh, flowable liquid form, we'll see some mention of, of a certain amount of protein. If they're not all natural, we'll see some mention of the amount of, of protein that is from non-protein nitrogen. And, and in, in today's world, the majority of that in, in a commercial feed product is going to be supplied through urea. Okay, and so urea, if you noticed on that previous table, you know, it's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 280 or more percent uh, protein. Okay, and that's because of its incredibly high nitrogen content. And really what urea does is it serves as a source of ammonia to uh, those rumen microorganisms. So, so in that light, it acts as a source of, of rumen degradable protein. But the reality is that those microorganisms can't really do anything with that ammonia if energy is a, is a limiting factor. Okay, so that conversion of urea and thus its ammonia to, to microbial crude protein is energy dependent. Okay, and we know that there are certain sources of energy that are much more effective at, at converting that ammonia into, into true microbial crude protein than others. And then they're referenced in this upside down triangle with starch being uh, the most effective of those. So a little bit of corn can go a long way with non-protein nitrogen. The flip side of that is if we have a, a ration that's not being supplemented with a readily, sor readily available source of fermentable carbohydrates, so we're talking about low quality hay, low quality forages, uh, there's not going to be uh, enough energy available to convert all that ammonia or much of that ammonia into microbial crude protein. The other thing we need to recognize is that that urea is rapidly converted to ammonia and that ammonia won't really wait around for energy. Okay, and so if the energy is not there when that happens, there's some of that that's going to be recycled, but each time it gets recycled, there's going to be a loss associated with that. Uh, but But we're not going to get uh, nearly the the transition or or translation of that from ammonia to protein as we we would uh, like to see if energy is a limiting factor. Okay, and the other thing that I, I want to caution you and make sure that we don't lose sight of or overlook because I'm certain that 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 both Jeff and I have have dealt with uh, situations that have arisen because of this is that urea toxicity is a real thing. It is a concern. Okay. Now this, I'm not. We're not presenting this to you to to terrify you of using urea or a, a source of non-protein nitrogen, um, but we need to be careful about certain risk factors. And one of those is poorly conditioned cows, uh, particularly if you think about certain parts of the country now that are have been experiencing prolonged drought. Um, cows don't have enough to eat. They're probably going to overeat. Uh, feed products that we provide to them with urea and the risk of them developing toxicity is real. Um, need to be a little concerned about really young calves without a fully functional rumen. That hasn't created nearly as many issues as, as poorly conditioned cattle has. And then also if we're feeding raw soybeans because of the urease inhibitor that it contains can make any supplemental uh, urea uh, toxic at a very, very low level. Uh, we remove that that risk and issue if, when those soybeans have been have been roasted. Okay, now now transitioning a little bit away from microbial protein and, and wrapping up with this rumen undegradable protein fraction. So that's going to be the portion of protein that is protected from fermentation in in the rumen, and so it's going to move or pass through that rumen environment uh, through the reticulum, through the omasum. So those first three compartments of that ruminant for get unchanged. Uh, and then they're going to be digested in the abel mason and, and small intestine prior to being absorbed. We need to keep in mind that not all of that is going to be digested and absorbed. Okay, very little in, in nutrition and physiology is 100%. Okay, so what isn't is going to pass out of the animal via, via manure. Okay, so if we're in a situation where we've done something from a management standpoint that limits uh, utilization of that, we're, that's an expensive way to, to increase the nitrogen content of fertilizer. 
okay? So historically, we've used some range of numbers of 60 to 80% to indicate the amount of rumen undegradable protein that's actually digested and absorbed. There's been some more recent uh, research that, that would say that in a lot of situations, that may be problematic and we may be overestimating the amount that's actually available to the animal. Okay, so for a lot of our, our common protein supplements, uh, so think about distiller's grains, think about soybean meal, blood meal, cottonseed meal, uh, some of those, rumen undegradable protein digestibility is going to be relatively high. It's going to be in the vicinity of, eight, uh, of the upper 80s and 90% uh, digestible. That protein fraction's digestibility, however, is going to be much lower uh, for forages, particularly for our overly mature, uh, low quality dormant type forages. And so um, what this graph shows is, is some work that was published, uh, that was done at the University of Nebraska, published back in 2013, but it does a really nice job of showing that that change in, in undegradable protein digestibility over time. So as, as both smooth brome grass and native warm season perennial grasses mature. And I think that concept holds true uh, regardless of, of which forages we're talking about, <clears throat> regardless of, of where you're, you're sitting at tonight listening to this webinar. Uh, the other thing that I think this does a good job of showing is that there are differences uh, across forage species. In particular here, we'd be comparing a, a cool season forage uh, to, to warm season forages, okay? And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and transition into, into protein requirements a little bit, but before I do that, I wanna go ahead and pause and, and open the floor and just see if there's anything, Jeff, uh, that you wanna mention that I've maybe breezed over or, or clarification that you need to provide or anything along those lines. Thanks, Dr. Smith. And uh, uh, the one thing I would just try to uh, keep keep you all thinking about is, as Dr. Smith went through on the forages, it's important to realize that even though we presented a table with uh, UIP or, or undegradable fraction of protein for various feedstuffs, uh, this point right here is important that in the forages, you're going to have a mixture as well as uh, of degradable and undegradable. Typically that uh, bypass or escape protein is what we're referring to as the undegradable fraction. You might have heard those terms tossed around, but that is often tied up into the cell wall and uh, or a good fraction of that can be tied up into the cell wall. And so as that plant gets more mature, uh, you can see a reduction in digestibility of that crude protein and so that's what this chart is trying to uh, show you. And then also we have some forages, for example, like alfalfa that can have some significant uh, quantities of soluble protein and it can be readily available in the room and uh, to provide a higher level of, of degradable protein uh, to the bacteria so, and, and microbes. So just remember that, that when we're thinking about these species does play a pretty big role in the composition of the protein. Jason, that's all I have for now. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Lemcooler. All right, so moving on and, and starting into protein requirements. So I'm going to start with growing cattle, and, and as I transition to the next slide, we'll, we'll start to talk a little bit more uh, about cows, but there's a couple big picture items that, that we hope that you'll take away from, from this slide. And it's not memorizing or, or getting lost in what these specific numbers are. Uh, but from a growing cattle standpoint, there's really gonna be two major factors that are gonna influence protein requirements. Those are gonna be size, so weight, uh, and it's gonna be average daily gain, so performance. So, so how, how much we're expecting those animals uh, to, to gain for us. Uh, and so as cattle get bigger, the total amount of protein that they require uh, for maintenance increases, okay? And so as we go from a 400 pound calf to a 600 pound calf to an 800 pound calf, those, the amount of protein that they require goes up, okay? The other thing that happens though is as that animal gets bigger, it actually becomes a little more efficient in terms of, of how it utilizes that protein. And so, so its requirements disproportionately start to, uh, to decrease. And so um, 
if we were to express these numbers on a per unit of body weight basis, so per hundred weight or per pound, as that animal gets bigger, the amount of protein per pound that's required goes down, okay? And from an average daily gain standpoint, those same concepts uh, apply. And so as we expect gain to increase, the total amount of protein that's required to support that growth, particularly uh, for lean tissue accretion, is gonna increase. Okay, but the same concept applies in that uh, as gain gets higher, there's a slight there's a slight increase in efficiency in terms of how uh, that is utilized. Okay, and so what we've shown here, these numbers, the, the middle column is going to be metabolizable protein requirement expressed in an amount per day. And then I've expressed crude protein requirement, assuming that about 60% of the crude protein that that animal eats is actually going to be converted to metabolizable protein. Okay, so that sum of, of microbial crude protein and, and digestible rumen undegradable protein. Okay, now as we, we shift over to, to cows, some of those same concepts apply, but, but there are also some additional factors that we have to consider. And so size is still gonna be uh, one of the major influencers. Pregnancy status is gonna be a major influencer. So, so not only whether that cow is pregnant or open, uh, but if she is pregnant, what stage of, of gestation she is in. Okay, and we'll, we'll outline these throughout the productive year for, for a cow uh, on the next slide. Lactation is a major contributor to protein requirements. Okay, milk is very expensive from a protein standpoint. And I think that's a topic that, that uh, Dr. Stewart and Dr. Lawman are probably going to address at least to some degree uh, from an energy standpoint at one, during one of the upcoming webinars in, in this series. Okay, so, so as, um, as the amount of milk that that female produces increases, her protein requirements increase substantially. And then if we think about our young cows, any growth requirements. So we often make the mistake of thinking of, of a female as soon as she is calved for the first time as being mature. The reality is she's not gonna really be done growing until uh, after we've weaned that second calf. And so, so she does require some protein to support, support growth until she's uh, achieved that, that status. And then, and then some protein additionally to, to regain her her, uh, her lean, lean muscle mass uh, as it changes and she pulls from it throughout the year. What I've done here that's a little different is, is I've calculated that crude protein requirement and amount assuming that conversion efficiency from crude to metabolizable protein is 60%, but I've also done it assuming 50%. 60% is probably gonna get us close in a lot of forage-based settings uh, that may be, may be limited to some degree from a forage maturity or an overgrazing standpoint during short periods or short times throughout the year. 50 is probably going to get us a little closer if we, have, if we have some larger issues associated with those things. But the point here uh, that, that I'd like to use this to make is that a 10% reduction in, in efficiency of conversion from crude to metabolizable protein causes a huge change in that female's total dietary crude protein requirements. And it's hugely disproportionate, okay? And so in a lot of these situations, that increase may be as much as a half to three quarters of a pound of crude protein. And so if we're underestimating or we're overestimating those things from a supplementation standpoint, those mistakes can become very costly uh, very quickly. And so, as I mentioned, uh, the next thing that we wanted to do was, was really move through what that cow's protein requirements look like throughout her productive year. And so, this has all been a calculated for a, for a 1,300 pound, uh, five-year-old mature cow using that, that conversion efficiency of 60%. So, as I mentioned, something that'll get us pretty close in, in most situations. And again, what you'll notice is, is I'm expressing these in an amount uh, because that's a reality is that this female requires a certain amount uh, of these nutrients. And so, what we've done is we've taken each month of that productive year Okay, and, and they're listed in months since calving. And I've taken each of those major uses 
uh, and broken them into individual bars and then summed those, so totaled those as the line that you see uh, up towards the top portion of the graph, okay? And so what we see happening is maintenance staying fairly steady, her requirement for maintenance, so a little over uh, a pound and a quarter of protein per day throughout throughout the year. If she is, if that cow is a 1,500 pound cow, these lines shift up. If she's a 1,200 to 1,100 pound cow, those lines shift down. Okay, um, lactation, and so she's going to achieve peak lactation somewhere somewhere there in the vicinity of two months uh, post calving. What you'll notice is is for this quote unquote average milk production uh, type cow, that's a huge protein sink. Okay, milk is again a huge protein sink for that female. Get out to to month six to seven post calving. Hopefully, lactation is going to stop. Uh, when we wean the calf, uh, but the th other thing that that starts to contribute to her overall protein requirements are hopefully going to be the little one uh, cooking in the oven if she's going to be productive for us and she's going to calve once every uh, calendar year. And what we'll notice is that those requirements are relatively small during the first trimester. They get somewhat larger, still relatively small during the second trimester, but then become fairly substantial uh, throughout uh, that last trimester of gestation and, and similar concepts apply. If we increase uh, milk production potential of that female, uh, this lactation, uh, these lactation bars go up. If we increase birth weight of that calf, uh, these bars go up as well. The, the other thing that I want to do and, and that we want to use this as an opportunity to for you to reflect upon uh, in the future as we're making supplementation decisions is that at that peak peak time of requirement, so about two years post calving, okay, or, or excuse me, two months post calving, her requirements are going to be the greatest. Well, if we want her to calve once every calendar year, that's the time when she needs to get pregnant. She needs to get bred back again between that two and three month mark. Um, and so if we have a substantial protein deficiency, we have to be able to fill, fill that. And one thing that I like to point out, if, if we're, we have a substantial deficiency, and let's say it's during that time where, where protein requirements are substantial, uh, and let's just say we'll use a, an example here of a, of a feedstuff that's self-limited. Let's just say this supplement is 20% protein, uh, it's self-fed, so we think, okay, well, 20% protein, that should be should be plenty to help meet requirements. But if that's a limit-fed feedstuff, and let's just say in this example of a, of a cooked-type protein tub, uh, that that female is going to only consume a half to three-quarters a pound. We'll just say in this scenario, she consumes a half a pound per day. If she consumes half a pound of something that's 20% protein, she's only gaining one excuse me, let's use 20, we'll use 25% protein for that tub as an example. She's only going to consume one eighth of, of one pound of protein. Okay, so if her requirement's three pounds at that moment in time, and we have a substantial protein deficiency, that's going to be really expensive and ineffective way of, of trying to fill that void and, and meet her nutrient requirements. And that's operating under the assumption that, that all of that is able to be converted um, into uh, true protein, okay? Jeff, as we, as we start to transition towards some more applied uh, considerations and, and strategies, I figured I'd go ahead and pause here. Is there anything else that you'd like to, like to add as it relates to protein requirements? Thanks, Dr. Smith. I, I think this would be a good time just as you reflect back on the requirements. We've talked about pounds per day of protein and not percentages that many of us are familiar with because we send a forage off and get a test back and it tells us the percentage crude protein in the feed stuff. But realize that pounds is important. Cows don't go out and, and eat percentages. They eat quantities of, of forages and they're getting quantities of nutrients in. And as an example, if if a cow needed three pounds of protein a day to meet requirements there around lactation, if she consumes 30 pounds of dry matter a day, then that can be a 10% feed stuff. But if she's only consuming 20 pounds of dry matter a day, that 
is going to have to be a 15% crude protein uh, forage to deliver that three pounds there around lactation at, at peak. So this is why we wanted to talk to you more on a pounds per day requirement rather than the percentages, because, you know, even with our computer models that we have today, um, estimating or predicting intake of grazing cattle is one of our biggest challenges and has quite a bit of variation. And so, the more we can do to test forages and get a handle on what our forage quality is going to be, the better we can begin talking about this applied part, Dr. Smith, that you're going to jump into now. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Limkuhler. And, and I think that serves as a good segue, that last point that you brought up into, into this slide, which is really focusing on the influence of dietary protein on forage intake. So forage crude, the relationship between forage crude protein content uh, and dry matter intake expressed as a percentage of body weight. And, and so we know that if if the rumen degradable protein supply limits microbial protein synthesis, forage intake is going to be restricted. Reality is it takes protein uh, to make microbes and it takes microbes to digest forage. Okay, and so there is this direct, although it's, it's somewhat quadratic in nature, uh, relationship between forage crude protein content and forage intake. And, and the graph you see to the right is some data that, that we pulled from a meta-analysis that, that a graduate, previous graduate student of mine, Connor Beeler, uh, and I have, have been working on. Uh, and it does a really nice job of showing two things. One, that, that there is a relationship between forage protein content and, and forage intake but also that there is quite a bit of variation there. And so there are a lot of other factors that, that contribute to how much forage cattle consume. And as Dr. Limkuhler mentioned, this is probably forage intake is, is one of the greatest limiting factors in us being able to precisely supplement and, and, and feed cattle or our ability to predict forage intake is. And so that's where uh, this, this effort of, of of Connor Beeler's and, and ours and our group is to really try to help quantify some of these things uh, in in supplemented and non-supplemented cattle, so that we can we can predict that as precisely as possible. That allows us to be as strategic as possible in in supplementation. Okay, and so. Um, the other thing that, that we need to note is that digestibility and, and ultimately what digestibility equates to is energy content, or at least the energy that's going to be available to the animal to be utilized, and protein, they decline as forage is mature, okay? And, and, and that's an issue that the reality is we face year after year uh, in that if forages are going to grow, they're going to mature, and so they're not going to stay the same. Uh, throughout throughout even a grazing season within within that year, uh, another even smaller data set that I thought we thought would be good to to show to you is a relationship between between diet digestibility or forage digestibility uh, and and forage crude protein content. And so I think one of the interesting things we can point out here is that very similar relationship between forage intake that we looked at on the previous graph. And, and forage digestibility that we see here, or at least the fashion or the shape of this relationship, okay? And that's really the reason why, or, or the mechanism through which dietary protein influences forage intake is because it influences digestibility. More microbes equals more digestion, more digestion equals more energy available to the animal. Uh, and where this becomes very important from a practical feeding standpoint is going to be our low and even to some extent our medium quality forages. If we look at this, this graph on the, on the X or the, the horizontal axis, we, we start at about 6% forage crude protein and go up to about 16% crude protein is, is that digestibility increases, but then it really plateaus once we get out beyond that that 12% uh, of, of dietary dry matter mark. If we go back to this previous slide, we see a very similar, uh, a very similar thing happening uh, with intake. So just a little more evidence to support how, how well those two concepts go, go hand in hand. 
Uh, and the next thing we want to we want to do is is use that to to lead into this, a little bit of discussion on the associative effects of supplemental feedstuffs. And so that data that we just showed you uh, was really for forage only, so non supplemented. Uh, cattle. But the reality is that when we start supplementing forages, and so we start feeding this component system where cattle may have free choice access to forage, uh, but we're limit feeding uh, a certain supplement, then that there are going to be some associative effects of those supplemental feedstuffs on forage digestion. Okay, in most situations, there may be a few where there's not really any response, but in most situations, there's either going to be a positive or a negative response. And so what these bars show and, and pulled numbers off of here just to show the concept, because the magnitude of these changes is going to be dependent upon uh, that supplementation practice or strategy. Uh, but if we look at this first bar on the left of, of unsupplemented, and if this is going to be the level of, of forage intake, a negative associative effect on digestibility will cause a, a decrease in forage intake. So this bar decreases. Uh, and then that's going to be filled to some degree, but not completely, by the um, additional amount of, of supplement that that animal is consuming, but to the extent that it results in a net decrease in overall intake. And then the opposite is true for, for feedstuffs or supplements that, that tend to have a positive associative effect. Uh, and so we would see not only that additional intake that's attributed to the amount that's being supplemented to those animals, but also an increase in forage intake because of an increase in digestibility. And from a protein supplementation standpoint, and, and I hope that, that Dr. Stewart and Dr. Allman will discuss this some uh, from an energy standpoint uh, in their upcoming uh, webinar and that's a part of the series but but for our intent and purposes focusing on protein tonight which is very difficult it's really impossible to try and separate energy and protein because they do go hand in hand but in most situations any associative effect of protein supplementation is going to result in a positive effect on on the intake uh, and, and digestibility up to the point to where we have a, a, a large amount of supplementation that's just displacing uh, forage intake because of limitations in, in gut fill. Okay. Now, as it relates to associative effects and changes in digestibility, there, there's one point that we wanted to make sure that we, we brought up and at least mentioned tonight. And it's, it's this concept of extending forages and, and using protein supplementation to extend forages. Because one of the things that we, we have to recognize is that as we increase forage utilization, so that positive associative effect, that really doesn't equate to preserving forages. And that particularly uh, is not going to be an effective way of preserving forages during a drought. Because really when we talk about increasing utilization, we're increasing digestibility. And as digestibility increases, intake increases. And so we may get more or the cattle may get more out of those forages, but they're also going to consume more of them. OK, and that's going to be particularly true for a low and medium quality forages. So in a drought situation such as a lot of the southwestern portion of the country is experiencing right now uh, to a severe extent in a lot of those locations, um, that's going to make forages disappear faster. And I think that's something that, that we absolutely need to have in the back of our mind and be aware of it, that if we're using that to try to make forages last longer, uh, if we're talking about grazed forages, that's not going to work. The only situation where that's probably going to work is if we're in a limit feeding uh, hay or, or TMR type uh, situation. Okay, wanted to mention a little bit about frequency of supplementation. Uh, you know, there's a, probably a lot more discussion about this uh, west of the Mississippi than there is east of the Mississippi, but it is something that, that is, is considered and, and some differences that are practiced across the country. In a nutshell, the majority of the work is going to support the notion that that protein can be supplemented fairly infrequently at times, depending upon the source of protein, as infrequently as, as once weekly, without a lot of negative repercussions for cows, okay? There's probably gonna be greater repercussions for, for growing cattle if we go to extreme uh, in, infrequencies in, in supplementing cattle. 
uh, due to slight decreases in average daily gain. But, but I would caution you when you exercise going to those extremes, because a lot of the the experiments when when we when we think about trying to evaluate small differences we need a lot of cattle and a lot more cattle than we're able to utilize in, in most applied research settings and so i would i would caution you to use use exercise uh if you are considering uh or you are currently or considering going to to a once a week supplementation uh, scheme that's definitely not going to be advisable for energy supplements or, or supplements that are containing urea, not going to be advisable in situations where we have a severe or substantial uh, protein uh, deficiency. One thing that that will do is we decrease the, the frequency or we increase the amount of time that passes between uh, supplementation events from a protein standpoint. We're we're going to expect that to decrease low quality forage intake to some degree, but it's also going to decrease protein retention. And so we're not, we're not going to get as much out of that protein. Um, in, in most situations, if we need to get away from a once daily supplementation, either ultimate day or, or twice per week supplementation is, is going to be more advisable, at least from my standpoint. Um, if it's a situation where we have to, supplement those cattle once weekly, I would strongly encourage you to employ a limiter uh, in your program, whether that's that's using a product that's pre-formulated with the limiter in it or or purchasing a limiter and, and mixing into your product uh, at home. I think that's a situation where a limiter can have um, a lot, a lot of value. And so as we transition into, into some applied um, a more applied and practical application type things. If if we think about where the starting point should be for designing our supplementation programs, and, and we're here to talk to you tonight about protein supplementation, but I think these concepts remain true if we're talking about protein and energy, they're true if we're talking about minerals and vitamins, is that if we're talking about grass cattle, forages are the base, they're the foundation of our nutritional management protein or excuse me, nutritional management program. And therefore, anything that we do from a supplementation standpoint really should revolve around that forage base. Uh, if it doesn't, there is a there is a great chance that that we are we are either going to be under supplementing or over supplementing and each of those are going to have their own uh, negative consequences. And, and so I want to take a moment just to walk through one scenario uh, and, and put some of this uh, into a little bit of application. And we'll come back to how we go about designing those, those programs or would recommend going about designing those programs. Uh, so this is a scenario uh, where I'm using native uh, short grass prairie. So I'm, I'm coming to you tonight from Amarillo, Texas in the Panhandle uh, where, where short grass prairie dominates the majority of our cow grazing um, situations. In this scenario, I'm going to say we're stocked conservatively, so cattle have some ability to, to select. Um, in this situation, uh, we're calving, so the calving season of that herd is set up in synchronization with forage nutrient composition. Okay, and so this is a situation where we are calving in May so that that animal's protein requirements or needs are gonna, gonna be in synchronization with the expected composition of that native short grass prairie, okay, and how it changes throughout the productive year. Now, I wanna note that if we're in a different part of the country, if we're using different forages, the, the shape of these curves is going to change. Okay, and so uh, if we're, we're intensively managing forages, uh, this is probably going to shift up. If we get into situations where, uh, where we're using some forage diversity, uh, we're going to widen this, the, the curve. And, and inherently in doing so, we're going to decrease um, the, the protein supplementation needs. Okay, now I'd also caution you, uh, and, and please do not leave here thinking that, that Dr. Lim Cooler and I came to you and told you that everyone needs to calve in May, because that is not true. That is absolutely not the point that we're trying to make. Uh, May may be the ideal situation in this scenario. In a lot of other situations, 
that's going to shift left or right on this axis okay so it's going to it may be a different month month of the year and even in sim, in in locations there's going to be variation in that depending upon management uh, you know, if we try to shift our calving season out into the middle of summer in the fescue belt where, where Jeff's coming to you from tonight, it's not going to work because we're not going to get cows pregnant in the middle of summer uh, if we're, we're grazing into fight infected tall fescue and not doing a, uh, a very intensive job of, of managing into fight levels. Okay. Now, a situation where we maybe get out of synchronization, and I see this as being an issue uh, a lot, is when when our calving time gets gets out of sync. Okay, so our, our calving season has not been matched with uh, with the protein requirements of that cow herd. It doesn't mean that we can't make this scenario work, but what it does is is it shifts to where we're overfeeding protein. Uh, for a large portion of the year, and then we have to supplement a much greater amount for a much longer period of time. And so I would encourage you to, to consider this concept, not these specific numbers, not, not, not get lost in the numbers, but consider the concept uh, on your own operation as you're, as you're considering making uh, management decisions, okay? And so one of the other things that we really need to focus on and we really need to consider and going back to that, that slide where I men we mentioned that our, our supplementation practices should revolve around that forage base when we're talking about grass cattle is that the reality is for most of us, uh, they're gonna, those forages are gonna be the most economical means of, of meeting the majority of protein requirements uh, in that forage base setting. Reality is they're not always going to do it by themselves. There are certain situations and certain management strategies and, and scenarios where, where producers are quite effective at being able to do that without any supplementation. Uh, but for most of us, it's probably going to require some supplementation at some point uh, throughout the year as it relates to, to protein nutrition. And so this is really, I think, a, a, a good point to bring up just the thought of, of forage testing, whether we're talking about hay sampling and analysis, or we're talking about working with a nutritionist and doing some, maybe even some, some graze forage or pasture forage sampling and work to really get an understanding of, of, of what the nutrient base of our cow herd looks like. If we have that information, we can, we can use that to identify more complementary type supplemental feedstuffs that are gonna, that are gonna fill that void uh, in nutrients, here we're talking about protein, uh, that remains. And then, you know, when we when we make that decision of what that feed stuff should look like, it needs to be something that's fed at a level or consumed at a level that's going to provide enough supplemental nutrient to fill the void. And then probably want to feed it in a form that complements our environment and matches our, our management style. Spent quite a bit of time in Tennessee where we're feeding loose dry distillers uh, to cows worked really well. Uh, here in Amarillo, that doesn't work very well because a large portion of it's going to blow away in the wind, as would be the case for a lot of us uh, uh, in the in the, uh, the the central plains and and even in in the further west. Okay, you know, as we start sorting through feed supplemental feed stuff options, some of our major factors that we want to make sure that we we consider. You know, well, first and foremost, what options are actually available to you? From that. Are they actually going to supply what your cattle need? Do they require any additional expenses or potentially even lead to some savings in terms of maybe time, labor, storage, or, or waste, or, or shrink? Um, do any of those options uh, that remain act as a vehicle of delivery for something else that adds value? That could be a technology that we're talking about. I mentioned, or we mentioned limiters. Uh, it could be something as like an ionophore. It could be something uh, where a situation where that supple protein supplement is also serving as a vehicle of delivery for our mineral uh, supplement program uh, for those cattle. And so there, there is a value to those things that we need to be able to, uh, to, to quantify and, and factor into these considerations. And then, and then once we've gotten to that point, really to us, it, it comes to which option is the most economical means of, of filling that nutrient void. And probably the best way that we can go about doing that is, is through focusing on, on nutrient cost. Uh, and the reality is that not all feeds were, were created equally and retail price rarely reflects those differences. Um, 
nutrient content and, and variation across these different options really bias that comparison if we're if we're focusing on retail price. And so we need to we need to consider basing supplementation decisions on nutrient needs and supplement value. Uh, and, and if we if we do that, particularly using supplement value and, and using nutrient cost as our metric of supplement value, that's going to help to level that playing field and, and account for the differences in nutrient content. And so we take an, an apples to, to oranges comparison and make it an apples to apples comparison. Uh, removes a lot of that bias. And, and we can calculate that in its most simple form as the final cost per pound of feed divided by the amount of nutrients. So in this situation, the amount of nutrient per pound of feed. So in that previous example that, that we mentioned, that 25% crude protein supplement, one pound of that contains 0 0.25 pounds of crude protein. Okay, and just to really quickly go through a, a, a comparison where we've applied that, we've got four supplemental feedstuff options, okay? Two of those, A and C, are 28% protein on a feed tag, so on an as-fed basis, uh, and then two of them are 16% protein, bought in different, uh, different amounts or, or sizes. One of them's bought as a 200-pound tub. The others are bought uh, really in, on a per-ton basis. And we've got a substantial amount of difference in retail price. So we take that over to, to in retail price in dollars per pound. We'll see there's there's a substantial amount of difference there. And if this is all the information that we have, most of us are probably going to select that option B. But if we were to take this and, to, and, and apply it to an applied feeding scenario where we've, we've worked with a nutritionist, we've identified that void that we need to fill. And in this situation, we're going to say that void is we need to pro provide a half a pound of supplemental crude protein per cow per day to a 50 cow herd over a period of 100 days. That answer changes. Okay, and so what we've done, and I know we're, we're getting short on time, if we get over here to, to this cost per pound of, of protein, so this nutrient cost, we've shifted from option B appearing to be our most economical option to realizing that option C is probably our most economical option. And we've just extrapolated that out to a dollars per, per cow per day. Uh, basis and then on to a total cost over the supplementation period basis. And so if we look at the differences between those, those are substantial. And in certain situations, those may be the difference between having a profitable year uh, versus, versus having a non-profitable year. Okay, and that's probably evaluating nutrient cost in its most simple form. One of the things that, that we've done very recently is, is we've developed a an Excel-based tool that is, is hopefully going to be available to you uh, before the end of this webinar series uh, that allows you to make some of those decisions. And I won't spend a lot of time uh, discussing this right now, but we will be, uh, we will be providing supporting materials so, so that anyone has the ability uh, to use this. There's also a simple version that we created that's available right now at at utbeef.com. Uh, I would encourage you to, to visit with, with your, your, your local extension resources, whether that be a county agent, uh, a regional specialist, or a state specialist, to identify maybe what options exist within your state that have been tailored more closely to your needs. Um, but these are this is an option, or these are two options, one of which is currently available, another that will soon be available. I would I would encourage you to not lose sight of the hidden costs of supplementation. I mentioned that example, that scenario that we showed you is, is evaluating this in its most simple form. Um, but the reality is that supplementation costs much more than, than what that feedstuff's purchase price is. And so a lot of the hidden costs that we, we often forget or often just just decide not to consider would be things like transportation and delivery. Things like storage facilities, what it actually costs us to store that, that feed stuff, what it costs us to actually deliver it to cattle, so the equipment that we use, and then all the labor and time that goes into to doing those, those three things. And then one that, that we probably do as poor of a job at as any would be, would be factoring in shrink, but also evaluating what shrink is. Uh, on our operation. Shrink, uh, shrink can be a very eye-opening 
uh, thing for in terms of its comp contribution to cost once we actually start start quantifying it. And so one of the other things that we're in the process of developing that will also soon be available uh, is, a, is an additional tool, so another supplemental resource that for those of you that may be interested in, in trying to, to get a handle on what some of these transportation, storage, and feeding, and shrink costs are as well as labor costs, uh, there's going to be a tool that's available that helps you helps you do that. It's not going to be as as simple to navigate and, and utilize as that previously previous one was mentioned. But hopefully, those of you that are that are interested in going this far and evaluating these things will will be able to get uh, some use out of it. And so as we close, and then and then at once once I get through closing thoughts, I'm going to provide Dr. Lumkur with another opportunity to to maybe mention anything uh, that I've left out or or other things that we need to be considering. Were that you know we were tasked with with visiting with you about protein supplementation tonight, and, and I do want to want to re mention that it, it is very difficult from a nutrition standpoint to, to separate protein and energy because they really go hand in hand. And in a lot of situations, protein gets more credit than it deserves. You know, I, I, I put a couple quotes up there that, that I, I hear and have heard a lot in that we think about feed quality only based upon its crude protein content. And some of that is 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 on us from an educational standpoint. Some of it is also because of feed labeling requirements and, and how we market feeds in, in the US. But but there's this perception that if we're supplementing something and that something has some protein in it, that nutrition is generally not the problem. And, and in a lot of situations, that couldn't be farther from the truth because we need to appreciate that energy drives changes in growth and performance, okay? It's protein that supports those energy dependent changes. And, and I want to leave you with this thought of, of, of not getting into a situation or, or not expecting to feed yourself out of an energy deficit using protein. Okay. And so this is something that the Dr. Lawman and Dr. Stewart are going to really, I think, focus on in the, the upcoming webinar. Uh, this is not to discredit protein. Protein is a critically important nutrient. Reality is it's not the only one, okay? And so really we need to probably give energy a lot more focus than, than we as a beef production community have, have done in the past. And then a few final take home points. The reality is, and we spent quite a bit of time talking about this at the beginning, uh, and hopefully we didn't bore too many of you to death with this, this point that protein nutrition and requirements are complicated. They're not as easy as, as animals just require a certain amount of protein, unfortunately. And so I would encourage you uh, to, to work with a nutritionist that either understands or is willing to put in the work necessary to understand your operation. Uh, again, don't expect to use protein to feed yourself out of, of an energy deficit. Uh, and, then, and then hopefully you'll be able to take at least a few factors, a few things away from this presentation to be, to be strategic about meeting protein requirements or, or to use to evaluate your practices uh, and, and hopefully allow you or empower you to to meet protein requirements in, in the most economical uh, way possible. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and put our contact information up there in case there are any questions or anything you, you were interested in visiting with us about uh, at a time in the future. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff uh, in case there's anything else that I missed um, that, that he wants to, to, wants to add and, and then we'll go from there. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Just a a couple of things to keep in the back of your mind that we we often see is um, some issues that energy is certainly going to be probably more limiting for us in the fescue belt um, on our spring calving herds. But but don't overlook the fact that we have several herds that fall calve, particularly late fall calvers that are going to hit uh, peak lactation, you know, somewhere in that time frame where we're shifting from grazing some fescue pasture to hay, we can run into a protein deficiency for those cows that are that are near peak or just coming off of peak lactation when we switch to 
our average fescue hay, even though it's good hay, uh, oftentimes it may only test seven to nine percent crude protein and that that cow has a requirement where she's not going to get that met. So testing those forages is critical. Uh, another common mistake that we'll see in some of our backgrounders and, and uh, even when we're developing heifers is we know corn silage is a great feed supply and energy, very cost effective but it's relatively low in crude protein in the, in the mid eights. And so if we've got a, a growth requirement that would require that diet to be, you know, 11, 12%, uh, you're not gonna do that alone with corn silage. And so we can take a feed stuff that's really, really good uh, and get poor performance because we didn't balance that degradable protein need and then also get some UIP down to the intestine for that calf to, to build its own uh, protein. So just a couple of things that I wanted to, to bring up. We, we didn't want to end with you thinking that, well, protein supplementation is not needed. There are certainly cases where it is, and testing those forages is critical to help build that strat strategic approach and a cost-effective approach. We'll turn it back over if there's any questions. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate those those thoughts, Dr. Limcour, and, and really that that last mention you had about corn silage and you and I both have been involved in a, in a lot of situations where where a small change uh, in, in, in protein inclusion, so a small increase in, in protein inclusion in those heavy corn silage formulations results in a huge decrease in cost of gain on those cattle because of the huge performance response that we see and, and shift in, in growth composition. I think those are those are absolutely uh, great points. And so as you're thinking of questions, uh, please don't hesitate to, to type them into the, the Q&A box. Um, before we start taking questions, I do want to hand it over to, to Sarah McKay and, and really want to thank her uh, and the National Corn Growers Association for providing sponsorship for, for tonight's webinar series. I also want to thank Jerry and, and Joshua for, for providing Dr. Limkuhler and I with the opportunity to, to visit with, with you all tonight. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Well, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Lim Kohler for tonight's presentations. And good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah McKay, and I'm the Director of Market Development for the National Corn Growers Association. On behalf of NCGA, I'd like to thank you all so much for having us here tonight and letting us be a part of this webinar. At NCGA, we're always happy to partner with NCBA for events like this to help extend information to folks in the industry. Cattle producers are a critical customer for corn, and we're so appreciative of this partnership and excited for all the good work ahead of us. This partnership between NCGA and NCBA focuses on education and is truly about bringing the latest relevant information to producers in the industry. And I think each of our presenters has certainly helped us achieve that goal tonight. Be sure to mark your calendars for the October 20th webinar on energy supplementation for your herd featuring Lawton Stewart from the University of Georgia and Dave Lallman from Oklahoma State University. As we move into our question and answer session, please remember to type your questions into the question chat box. Thank you again for participating in the webinar tonight. I'm gonna to hand it over to Josh White with NCBA to discuss another virtual learning opportunity before moderating tonight's Q&A session. All right, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, we just wanted to also uh, make sure everyone had seen our press release, we opened up registration for stockmanship and stewardship virtual uh, experience that will be held November 11th and 12th. Uh, we just opened that up last week and we already have several hundred registered, but uh, obviously this crowd is keen to learn online and this is gonna be free. A lot of great uh, content, a little different focus than we typically do from the webinar series. So be sure and check it out at stockmanshipandstewardship.org. Um, and with that, we will get on to uh, questions and hopefully some answers. And I'm going to start out uh, with one for our, um, either one of our panelists can certainly jump in. And it's, and it's pretty basic back to one of the first slides. And that is, you know, how are you, how are you getting more than 100% uh, uh, number or 100 number on that urea? Could you explain that? Absolutely. And so that was something when I first started 
uh, looking into ruminant nutrition that, that that really blew my mind. And and I think it goes back to this concept of what crude protein is and what it measures. Okay, so crude protein is a measurement of nitrogen. Okay, and so uh, because the average protein contains 16% nitrogen, when we when we when we quantify crude protein, we're taking that nitrogen amount uh, and and dividing it, uh, or excuse me, multiplying it um, by uh, that conversion factor. Okay, and so that conversion factor being 6.25. And so if if we think about urea um, and, and that setting that so urea we're going to consider that it's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of, of just shy of about 45 or so percent uh, nitrogen and so we take that value uh, and we multiply that by 6.25 that's how we get to that number the thing that's that's very difficult about urea and there's been a ton of work uh, that that's been conducted in this in this area is that just because it has that crude protein level does not mean that all of that nitrogen is actually going to be assimilated into microbial crude protein okay uh, that's going to be energy dependent a very large portion of that if we're if if that diet is is high in fermentable carbohydrates so really high in starch so if think about a feed yard finishing ration that's that's got a considerable amount of corn in it by and large, the vast majority of that urea is going to get converted into microbial uh, crude protein. Uh, if we we transition and go to the other extreme of that and go to dormant native range, uh, crop residue, corn stalks, sorghum stalks, something along those lines, and we're not supplementing uh, a lot of fermentable carbohydrate, not going to get nearly as much of that uh, converted. And so the realized level would be much, much less uh, than that. Hopefully that, that answers a question. Jeff, do you have anything you want to add to that? Nope, I think you nailed it. And then this sort of goes along with that. Um, you And yeah, I think you did talk about this a bit, but just to, to recap, if, if uh, you're overfeeding nitrogen or protein, um, and I guess it would depend on the, you know, what the source was, but is it is it quote unquote lost? Is it used as an energy source? Um, you know, what happens to it essentially? Yeah, so it's a great question. And, and yes, so there there is a portion of that that, that will actually be metabolized or burned uh, as energy, uh, depending upon how, what stage it's gotten through in the process. There's a portion of that that gets converted to ammonia, if it doesn't get assimilated into uh, true protein, then a portion of that is actually gonna be absorbed and then recycled. It's gonna come back into, into the rumen eventually. And then whether or not it actually gets assimilated into protein is, is gonna be energy dependent. Um, the other thing is that, you know, there, there is an energetic cost to the animal to clear that excess protein. So there is a cost for overfeeding protein. There's a lot of situations, particularly uh, if we think about that best grazing time on our operation, it's gonna look different time of year, different forages for, for, for different operations in different parts of the country. But that best grazing time, I can almost guarantee you there's gonna be a substantial amount of protein that we are overfeeding. Um, and, and so there's, there's a cost of that. Uh, there's been some work that's done in that. I, I, I'd say we're, we're starting to move towards understanding what that cost is. That cost is probably higher in, in feed yards or, or in, in situations where we are, we are trying to push a high level of performance than it is going to be on the cow side where, where we're feeding less energy to begin with. Uh, but again, just, just starting to, to understand what that is, at least to the extent that we can try and try and model it and, and use it to make decisions with. Jeff, anything you want to, you want to add to that? The only other thing I'll add is that um, even though we don't tend to see it um, as often on the beef side, because, we don't feed as high a dietary protein um, as what the dairy industry would. 
the other cost could be a, a negative impact on fertility and that uh, excessive ammonia could potentially change uterine pH and reduce fertility. And uh, there's there's not been a lot of work on the beef side. Uh, my When I was at Wisconsin, my colleague, Dr. Dan Schaefer was looking at um, uh, some sensitive kind of pregnancies where you had in vitro fertilized embryos versus um, uh, just normal artificial insemination. And, and we did see a reduction in uh, conception rates when we had the more sensitive embryos going in to those pregnancies uh, due to feeding excessive dietary crude protein. And so that's a cost that is there that we don't really have a good handle on. And primarily because most situations we wouldn't see uh, beef cattle being exposed to high enough dietary protein to cause an effect. But that risk is there if we're maybe grazing some uh, heavily fertilized cover crop or uh, maybe some heavily fertilized uh, annual ryegrass down in the south. But again, that would be a, a much lower risk. And um, I, I would say we don't know enough how big that risk is at this point. Okay, great. A um, couple of other questions here. We had a lot of questions coming in with specific scenarios, and we will stay away from those. I will pass those along to our subject matter experts here uh, individually with your contact information for those of you that asked the questions. But I guess more back to the resources that you referenced, uh, Dr. Smith, that were online. Um, and maybe if there are some others that you guys can think of that might be useful. But a lot of those questions were around meeting basic requirements for protein for a class of cattle, uh, like dry cattle or uh, like different lactation, uh, you know, early or late. And mm -hmm. so I guess my question is on the resources that you shared, Dr. Smith, do those take into account helping you determine the requirement and then giving you some uh, ability to mix and match maybe some uh, feed sources to meet that requirement? Or um, do you need to come into some of those uh, tools already knowing the, the animal's requirement? How do those work? And then if there's any, you know, basic tables that may help some folks maybe that aren't as complicated that, as a reference for basic requirements, uh, would be helpful. Yeah, so um, to, to answer the first part of that question, so the, these new tools that, that I mentioned will, will help you do that to some degree, but, but you will really have to come to them prepared knowing what, what that deficit uh, might be. What, what they will do that I think is fairly unique is if you know what that deficit is and you include your feedstuff options, uh, it will, it will provide you with amounts that would be required to meet that deficit, but it still requires you to, to have quantified that information or worked with, with a nutritionist. There are some, some great resources uh, out there. Uh, I would encourage anyone to visit with their local uh, extension personnel to really be that resource and use that if you haven't already to engage uh, in that, in that, um, that process with them um, and for some of you that that may not be as easy uh, as others just depending upon resources within that state and, and accessibility um, and I, I'm going to go ahead and, and and just state any any specific questions or any help that that I can provide in that regard I'd be more than happy to but would encourage you to reach out to your your local uh, extension resources first and then the the other portion of that question, one of the things that we have been working on is is really a tool that, and it, this tool is further out from being available, but hopefully maybe within the next year or so it will be available. is is a decision making tool that helps you quantify some of those those things. So it helps you helps to prepare you. Uh, and provide you with that information you need to include. There's one that's that's fairly simple in nature, uh, but it may be worth checking out that that we developed uh, when I was at the University of Tennessee. It can also be found at that utbeef.com website under the nutrition tab, uh, and that's a forage analysis interpreter. Um, 
And, and again, it's it's a it's a very simple form of that, but it will help you take some of that information about your forages and about your cattle and help arrive at what those supplementation needs uh, should be. I would encourage you to 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 use that if you're interested, but also take those results to your decision support network. So whether that's your nutritionist uh, or that's your, your extension personnel and help have them go through that with you. I'm more than happy, happy again to, to help with that as much as possible. Uh, there are some other resources out there. I'm not familiar with all of them, but from a, from a general nutrition uh, program and quantification standpoint, uh, Oklahoma State University has a really nice program. University of Minnesota has a nice program. University of Georgia uh, has a nice program. And I'm not purposefully leaving anyone out. Those are just, just some of the universities that have some of those free web-based tools and resources that I know for me, as I was learning ruminant nutrition and studying this in college, they were very, very helpful to me. And I use them quite a bit. Uh, and so I, I would encourage y'all to to um, go that direction, but also again, don't lose sight of that local extension aspect because there may be a lot of situations that are fairly unique to your region uh, that would be useful. And I wanna hand it over to Jeff and see if he has anything to add, but I know in Kentucky, they've developed some really useful resources as well. Uh, one of those centered around feeding whole stillage uh, coming out of, uh, of whiskey production. So, uh, Jeff, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, we we actually, I'll, I'll say the resources are out there and reach out to each state. We have a, if you Google KY Forge Supplement Tool, um, we build a really simple web-based tool, plug in a few components from your forge test and what stage of production the cows are in, and it'll give you some supplement uh, estimates. But I think the one thing that we always forget is that every situation is going to be very conditional. And, and I tell folks that a tool like that will get you from home plate to second base. It's not going to hit a home run. And that's because, you know, the cows may be a little thin and they need to put on some condition. And um, you have to make sure that your nutritionist that you're working with understands they're going to be laying down some muscle and uh, maybe need a little higher protein in the diet in that situation. So there are several tools that are out there. Just reach out to your county extension agent or your your regional specialist and and get a hold of those or or get a hold of your nutritionist because they all have trained nutritionists on staff and and if it's we ask that there's somebody up above that can help you with those. And Jeff, I think that that raises a really good point in that as much as we would have liked to have brought to you tonight a slide of sets that shows you exactly what you need to feed and exactly when you need to feed it, we can't do that because it is so situationally dependent, uh, even within regions and even within very local areas. And so hopefully we've, we've given you some information to arm you to, to help you uh, start to make your way down that path. We like to say that we hope to stimulate more questions than what maybe we answered tonight, because that means that you were you were thinking about what um, Jason was delivering to try and fit it to your own situation. And it's if we did that, if you've got more questions now, then I think we've done our job because you, you thought about this and how it's going to apply to your cow herd and, and or your cattle. And so that's a that's a positive. So just now take that information and go back and think about, all right, first thing maybe I need to do is just get a forage test and find out where I'm at. Then I need to sit down with my nutritionist and see what sources of feeds are available. And and those are going to be regional and cost effectiveness is going to be regionally based. You know, we've we've got um, the distillery uh, industry here because of the bourbon industry, and that's a very economical source of energy and protein for us. But you know, I know that, uh, you know, Texas isn't going to have as much of that. So think about how you can fill those gaps with local cost effective supplements. Great advice. And then I just had one last question. Uh, there's a lot of other questions floating. And again, we'll get those answers out to you, hopefully in the next week or so from from some of our subject matter experts where they can help or point you in the right direction. Um, has technology helped? Um, you know, we're talking about these situations per farm or ranch, and especially with COVID, I know, uh, you know, extension may not 
folks may not be running the roads quite as much, but uh, does taking pictures of the cows and or the forage or some of that stuff, in addition to the forage tests, help give folks a good idea? Or are you guys aware of any of that type thing being used or FaceTime or other things? What's going on out in the country with extension these days? Yeah, so um, absolutely. I think any resources or any way that that the person that's helping you to make those decisions can get more information about the cattle, about your operation, about the scenario <clears throat> that you're help they're helping you make a decision for is helpful. I know. I know for me, yeah, I'm, I'm, when I'm asked supplementation questions, uh, it's always. Re- results in a volley of questions from me to try and get that understanding. And, and as, as it has been more difficult for us to travel recently, um, any of those remote ways that we can get that information is very helpful. Uh, Jeff, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. A picture is worth a thousand words when it comes to looking at forage quality, looking at fecal pats, those types of things can be very valuable. Uh, we've really tried to encourage uh, developing those, but um, there's also this whole issue of not being able to see everything and a farm visit still, you know, very important. And uh, we're still trying to do those as much as we can and get out there because we might think it's a protein issue, but it could be that there was a, you know, a calf that defecated in the water and the cows just aren't drinking uh, because the water's fouled. So sometimes it's as simple as that. Great. Well, thanks. Thank you guys for uh, joining us and presenting great information tonight. Hope everyone will join the rest of the series. Um, we really appreciate all that, that Extension's doing around the country for producers and trying to find unique ways to serve through this tough time. And with that, uh, look forward to seeing you all on the next webinar. Thanks again. Uh, Dr. Smith and Lem Kuehler, and also to our partners at Corn Growers. And you all have a great week. And uh, one more thing for those that are hanging on, we this is being recorded and will be posted. I did have a question in the chat. If you weren't here for the opening, you might not have heard that. So we'll get it posted up uh, in the next day or two at ncba.org. Uh, Thanks a lot, everyone.